Hello everyone. I want to start with a couple of verses from the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord loves the stranger. The Lord gives the stranger food and clothing. Love the stranger then, for you were once strangers in Egypt. I welcome you all, those who are present, and all of you online to this rather special and very topical study day on the question of the Catholic response to migrants and refugees. It couldn't be more relevant to what's happening in the world as we speak, as we meet. The bishops of England and Wales have produced a document which has that title, Love the Stranger, inspired by the book of Deuteronomy. And we're trying to just have a look at it, see what it says, what it means, what are the demands that it makes on us as a church and as, and as individuals. And we are very lucky to welcome to this parish of Gideon Park, all of you, many have been before for other talks, but above all to welcome Liam Olmark. Liam was involved in the writing of this document with the bishops. He is the head of communications, fundraising and advocacy for the Jesuit Refugee Service UK. I think the Jesuit Refugee Service is worldwide and so it's a, a huge player for the Catholic Church in this issue of migrants and refugees. Liam worked before going to his present job uh, for the bishops of England and Wales as an advisor on international affairs. He's also worked for various church agencies supporting refugees across the world, in Palestine, in Myanmar, Iraq, Thailand and Lebanon. And he has a particular link to these issues because his own family, I think like a lot of us here and a lot of you listening, our family background is shaped by migration. In Liam's case, uh, one side his father, uh, coming from Ireland for economic opportunity. Is that, that is your father? Mother, mother, oh, yeah. mother, his mother, the, the Irish side. And his father from Myanmar to escape military dictatorship. So, as I like to say to the congregations here in Gideon Park, we have an extraordinary richness with the people who just are in the pews and gather with us uh, as part of the church. So I feel personally it's just so important and so obvious that we need to step up and make a response in the present difficulties that are uh, being experienced all over the world. But it's not me going to talk about it, it's Liam. So please now welcome Liam Allmark. Thank you. So, um, thank you uh, first to Father Adrian for inviting me to speak today. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining the discussion here and mm -hmm. online. As Father Adrian said, I, I work for the Jesuit Refugee Service. Um, and for those um, of you who, who aren't familiar with our work, um, we're part of a worldwide Catholic network working in over 50 countries across the world. Um, and here in the UK, JRS has a, a particular ministry 
for people who've claimed asylum and been made destitute by um, UK immigration policy, as well as to people who are held in immigration detention. Um, and we advocate and serve and accompany um, refugees and forcibly displaced people um, of all faiths and none from across the world. Um, and tragically, as we know, as many of us will be aware, because of the new government legislation coming through, because of the new Illegal Migration Act, um, we're only going to see more people facing detention um, when they come to seek sanctuary here in, in the UK, and more people facing destitution when they're denied the right to claim asylum. So these challenges, as, as, as far as Radio said, are, are just likely to be getting more um, and more pressing. Um, as was mentioned before, starting with the Jesuit Refugee Service, um, I was an advisor for, for eight years for the Catholic bishops um, on international affairs, on migration and refugee policies, and had the privilege of working with the bishops earlier this year when they produced uh, Love the Stranger. Now, the document was produced by the bishops' department for international affairs, and I think that's really important because it reflects the fact that the stories of migrants and refugees, the journeys they undertake, begin long before they arrive um, in our country or in their destination country. And it's, it's really important that we take that, that, that world view and understand that people's stories begin a long time before we may ever meet them, before they become migrants or refugees themselves. And of course, it's been published against the backdrop of an increasingly toxic political culture, one where we're seeing people dehumanised more and more, where the UK is tearing up its obligations under the Refugee Convention, and where so-called border security is being put above human lives and human dignity. And sometimes it feels daunting how we respond to this. But what our bishops are doing in Love the Stranger is pointing to more than a hundred years of Catholic teaching that we can draw on. Answering that call in the Bible that we heard to love the stranger, popes from uh, Pope Leo back in the 1890s through to Pope Francis today have provided really quite extensive guidance for us as Catholics across the world in how we can respond to our sisters and brothers who leave their homelands to build a new life in our communities. And what our bishops have done in Love the Stranger is to take that teaching and to apply it to our context here in the UK in 2023 and onwards. And in doing so, they've provided a tool that we can all use as, as individuals, as parishes, as groups, as organisations, not only responding to current challenges like the Illegal Migration Act and the changes in legislation that we're seeing, um, but also to engage with our politicians ahead of the general election next year and to live out our faith and that church teaching in our own lives and our own communities. So over the next couple of hours, I'm going to talk through each chapter and the uh, church teaching that the bishops draw on, which comes mainly from documents and addresses by different popes throughout the year, but also contributions from other parts of the church around the world and offices of the Vatican. And each section ends with a set of, of principles where the bishops really distill what we as Catholics are being called to do. So I hope that as we go through the principles together at the end of each chapter, um, that some of them may really, really speak to you and may either reaffirm the actions you're already taking, the things you're already doing, or to inspire you in your own response. And we'll have a chance to um, discuss that um, and any questions you might have um, at the end and over lunchtime as well. But before we start going through the document, I just want to reflect on a line from the Bishop's Forward um, to the whole document, where they speak about the death of Alan Kurdi on that beach in Turkey back in 2015 that I think so many of us will, will remember. And I think this really gets to the heart of what Love the Stranger and actually the whole Catholic social teaching in this area is all about. I think this, this really encapsulates it. The, the, the picture on the left there is one of the, the, the few pictures of Alan Kurdi when he's alive that his family shared um, after he died. 
and the one on the right is actually of my own son at exactly the same age in exactly the same kind of park as, as Alan Curdy's playing in there. And the reason I put these images side by side is to illustrate the point that the bishops are making when they say that after Alan Curdy died, for a brief time, politicians, journalists and members of the public turn their attention to a person with a name and a story. He wasn't simply a migrant, a refugee or a statistic. He was a person. He was someone's son. He could have been my son. He could have been any of our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, nephews, if they were born in a different time or at a different place. And the central message of Love the Stranger, what the bishops are saying, is really quite a simple one. That every person who leaves their home to build their life here is just that. They're a person made in the image of God with a name and with a story. And that's got to be the starting point of how we respond as individuals and as a country. So let's take a look at how the bishops address this and how they unpick it. Now, Love the Stranger begins uh, with a quote from Pope Pius XII in a document that he wrote back in 1952 called Exile Familia Nazarethina, the exiled family of Nazareth, which is, of course, a reference to the fact that Mary and Jesus and Joseph were themselves refugees. And Pope Pius was writing this at a time when millions of people were still displaced across Europe at the end of World War II, and the uh, Arab-Israeli war had just displaced millions of more people in the Holy Land. And as part of the document, he set out that the, w the work that the church was doing all around the world, including here in the UK, uh, in response to migrants and refugees. And he said that there has never been a period in which the church has not been active on behalf of migrants, exiles and refugees. As uh, Bishop Paul McAleenan, who's the, the lead bishop in this area and, and one of the authors of Love the Stranger, explained in a document, in an in a, in a, um, event for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees last month, this, this isn't an optional extra. It's integral to our faith as Catholics, our service as Catholics, and it's integral to the church's mission. Now today, there are over 280 million people who are migrants and refugees worldwide. That's more than at any point in history. And for more than a decade, we've seen an increase every single year in the number of people driven from their homes by persecution, by poverty, and by conflict. So in 2018, Pope Francis called for the church to build upon that long history that Pope Pius was talking about by using four verbs, welcoming, protecting, promoting, and integrating. And he explained that welcoming means offering more options for migrants and refugees to enter countries safely and legally. So creating proper routes so that people don't need to risk their lives to reach safety. <coughs> He said that protecting is about upholding the rights and dignity of migrants and refugees, irrespective of their legal status. So that's treating everyone humanely and challenging practices like immigration detention. He said that promoting means empowering people to achieve their potential as human beings. So that's relevant to issues like the right to work for people who are seeking asylum. And he said that integrating is about providing opportunities for what the Pope called intercultural enrichment brought about by the presence of migrants and refugees. Effectively, that means recognising the gifts that people can bring to our countries and the contributions that they can make. And the Pope drew these together, drew these four verbs that he's calling for us all to, to, to work on together with a reminder that every stranger who knocks at our door is an opportunity for an encounter with Jesus Christ, who identifies with the welcomed and rejected strangers of every age. So Love the Stranger is really about continuing the church's mission, to uphold 
the human dignity of migrants and refugees in an increasingly difficult context. And even in the past few weeks, we've heard our own political leaders challenging the concept of multiculturalism, challenging the very basis of the global asylum system, calling to step up the use of immigration detention. And the bishops underscore how we as a church come from a very different starting point. And they refer to a resolution that they passed at the bishops conference last year when the Rwanda plan was first getting underway and when they really firmly opposed this, affirming the fundamental principle of the dignity of every person created in the image and likeness of God. And this leads to the first substantive chapter of Love the Stranger, which is all about taking a global perspective and our need to take a global perspective. And it picks this up with uh, Pope Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti, where he establishes that universal context in which we need to approach these matters and the need to acknowledge, appreciate and love each person regardless of physical proximity, regardless of where he or she was born or lives. And in the encyclical, he develops this through his reflection on the Good Samaritan and Jesus' call for us not to decide who is close enough to be our neighbour, but rather to actively go out there and actively become neighbours to all. And this has long roots in Catholic social teaching. In fact, our own bishops, in the document they published called The Common Good back in 1996, which is quoted there, said that our neighbourhood is universal, so loving our neighbour has global dimensions. Now, Pope Francis built on this a few years ago on the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, when he chose the theme Towards an Ever Wider We. He warned that in today's context, our concept of we, instead of encompassing the whole global community, is increasingly under threat from nationalist or individualist tendencies, and that the highest price for this is being paid by those who are viewed as the other, whether that's because they're living abroad in a different country to our own, or because they're new arrivals to our communities. And he calls on all of us to counter this trend by working towards the concept of a single human family. And the photo I've chosen here is actually one of a pizza restaurant based at a church in Jordan that, that I had the privilege of visiting last year. And it's part of an initiative where refugees can learn and share catering skills. Um, and as, as many of you will know, Jordan has one of the biggest refugee populations in the world. And what Pope Francis is challenging us to do is recognise that though they may be thousands of miles away, they are our sisters and brothers. And actually, in this case, uh, Catholics from across the world are actively living that out by supporting initiatives like this that offer people hope and offer people dignity. Now, the Pope's writing in this area also builds on an important principle in Catholic social teaching called the universal destination of goods, which essentially means that everyone should have access to all the goods of this world. Put another way, those of us in richer nations should not exclude others from the enjoyment of the riches that are available to us. Love the Stranger picks up on Pope John Paul II's explanation that God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of all its members without excluding or favouring anyone. This means that no one should be inhibited from enjoying the fruits of the earth because of where they were born. And the bishops say that we cannot therefore prevent people from migrating to better their condition. And Pope Francis really affirms that link between the right to migrate and the universal destination of goods in Fratelli Tutti, where he says that no one can remain excluded because of his or her place of birth, much less 
because of the privileges enjoyed by others who were born in lands of greater opportunity. The limits and borders of individual states cannot stand in the way of this. And he goes on to underline that it is unacceptable that the mere place of one's birth or residence should result in him or her possessing fewer opportunities for a developed and dignified life. Uh, the picture here is one we took in uh, Baghdida, one of the uh, towns in northern Iraq that was devastated by Daesh, by ISIS, uh, when they took it over, and where a huge proportion of people have left to build their lives in other countries uh, across the Middle East, across Europe, across America. And um, the church upholds that right to do so and our obligation to facilitate that. So... Catholic teaching offers really quite a radically different point of departure to the one that often shapes political discussion around migrants and refugees today. Rather than starting with a narrowed national focus, we're challenged to start with a global approach to upholding everyone's human dignity and to work from there. And we're called to ground our response in a recognition that the whole earth exists for the flourishing of all people, regardless of where they were born. So, drawing these themes together, the bishops present their first three principles of Love the Stranger. Firstly, that our response to migrants and refugees is rooted in that innate worth of each person, and this is the starting point for the whole thing. The biggest takeaway is that it's our duty as Catholics to put the human back at the heart of discourse, of policy, and of our, our own response. Secondly, that we must not exclude others from having the means to flourish simply because of where they were born. And thirdly, that nationalism should never be allowed to take hold and to prevent us from seeing humanity as one single family. The Pope is really clear that loving your country and caring for your country is, is positive. It's a good thing. We should be doing that. But at the same time, we always need to put the person above their national identity and recognise that we're all created equally and we're all part of that one family. And this is very closely linked to the second chapter of Love the Stranger, which is all about the right not to migrate, or what might better be described as the right to flourish in one's homeland. That's the, the language that the bishops use in, in the document. And this is probably an area that doesn't get enough attention. But it's a really important aspect of Catholic social teaching. And Pope Francis actually chose it as his whole focus for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees this year. It took place last month. And um, last month, Caritas Social Action Network and the Bishops' Conference held a really good webinar um, exploring um, this, this theme and exploring the Pope's message. Um, and it's definitely worth, worth watching on their website. So going right back to uh, the encyclical Verum Novarum in 1891, Pope Leo said that no one would exchange his country for a foreign land if his own afforded him the means of living a decent and happy life. And this hasn't changed much at all, as you can see, by the time we reach Fratelli Tutti, about 130 years later. Pope Francis explains that ideally, unnecessary migration ought to be avoided, but that this entails creating in people's countries of origin the conditions needed for a dignified life and for integral development. And the bishops really emphasise and love the stranger, and this is a, a really important point, that this isn't about mitigating or diluting our welcome to migrants and refugees, and we have to resist any attempts to, to misuse the church's teaching in this way. Rather, it's a simultaneous challenge to recognise that concept of one human family and to create conditions in which people do not have to leave their homes in the first place, that people aren't forced to make those journeys and to flee. And reflecting on this, 
Pope John Paul II spoke about some of the conditions needed for people to flourish. See here, he said, by means of a far-sighted local and national administration, by more equitable trade and supportive international cooperation, it is possible for every country to guarantee its own population the possibility to satisfy basic needs such as food, health care, work, housing and education, and that the frustration of these needs forces many people into the position where their only option is to emigrate. And it's important to note here that he's talking about countries' responsibility for their own economic and political stability, as well as the responsibility <coughs> of other nations to support their development. Uh, the photo taken here is from one of the bishop's visits um, to Gaza, which, uh, of course, is in the news again this morning for the uh, devastating developments that, that are happening around there overnight. And there, two million people um, are, are suffering. They've suffered at least four major conflicts in recent years, the endless humanitarian difficulties and violence. And they've clearly been failed by, by all sides and by the international community which has failed to reach a, a diplomatic solution in which people can live in peace and can flourish. And what Popes from Leo through to Francis are saying is that every one of those political actors has a responsibility to uphold people's human dignity. Everyone has a responsibility to hold them accountable for that. And this was also set out by Pope Paul VI in his encyclical, Populorum Progressio, where he said that the hungry nations of the world cry out to the peoples blessed with abundance, and the church, cut to the quick by this cry, asks each and every man to hear his brother's plea and answer it lovingly. So he's talking here about the responsibility of, of other nations, of rich nations, to help those nations that aren't able to provide for their people to flourish. And he talked about the things that richer nations of the world should be doing, about the need to act with mutual solidarity, with social justice, and with universal charity. And we see this message running through um, the, the, the teaching and the documents from different bishops' conferences um, across the world, the church throughout the world. Um, in that 1996 document, The Common Good, from the bishops of England and Wales that I mentioned, they very deliberately placed assistance for refugees alongside issues like fair international trade policies, control of the arms trade, support for United Nations and a, a, a just aid budget. And in 2010, the US bishops' own teaching document on migrants and refugees spoke about our responsibility as richer nations to promote a just peace in countries that are at war, to protect human rights in those countries that deny them, and to foster the economic development of those countries that are unable to provide for their own peoples. The important takeaway here is that addressing the driving factors that cause people to leave their homes as migrants or refugees is integral to Catholic social teaching in this area. We have a responsibility to address things like climate change, <coughs> conflict and poverty as well as making sure that we don't exacerbate them through our own actions. And again, Love the Stranger is speaking into a really difficult context. In the last few years, as we know, we've seen the aid budget slashed. We've seen targets on climate change being missed or being watered down. And just last month, up the road at the Excel Centre in London, the UK hosted the world's largest arms fair, selling bombs, guns, ammunition to governments across the world, many in places of conflict that people are fleeing from. And I mentioned that this was Pope Francis's theme for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees last month. And I just want to read out a couple of paragraphs from his message, because I think they sum this up really well. He said that the flight 
of the Holy Family into Egypt was not the result of a free decision. The decision to migrate should always be free, yet in many cases, even in our own day, it is not. Conflicts, natural disasters, or simply the impossibility of living a dignified and prosperous life in one's native land is forcing millions of people to leave. And he went on to say, eliminating these causes and thus putting an end to forced migration calls for a shared commitment on the part of all in accordance with the responsibilities of each. This commitment begins with asking what we can do but also what we need to stop doing. He said we need to make every effort to halt the arms race, to halt economic colonialism, to halt the plundering of other people's resources, and to halt the devastation of our common home. And so the bishops offer us three further principles. Firstly, affirming the right of all people to flourish in their homelands, and the duty of every nation to uphold this. Secondly, calling on our own government to play its role in supporting other countries, and they specifically talk about factors like aid, arms control, promoting human rights, and tackling climate change. And thirdly, talking about our own role in this especially through church organisations like CAFOD and Missio, which are providing practical support across the world to help people live dignified lives, through organisations like Pax Christi, which are challenging conflict and injustice. And the photo here is actually from a uh, Pax Christi demonstration outside the arms fair last month. Um, and Aid to the Church in Need, which is upholding people's human rights in some of the most difficult circumstances. And at the same time as affirming this right to flourish in our homelands, uh, Pope Francis also explains that until substantial progress is made in achieving this goal, we are obliged to respect the rights of all individuals to find a place that meets their basic needs and those of their families. So this next <coughs> chapter of Love the Stranger is all about the other side of the coin, the right to migrate. And again, it's not a new idea. You can um, see um, that um, popes uh, have talked about it in very similar circumstances. So in, in, in very similar terms to what Pope Francis is saying, so in uh, Pope John's encyclical Passum in Terrace back in the 1960s, he said that there, where there are just reasons in favour of it, a person must be permitted to leave their country and take up residence in another. And the church is really quite unequivocal about this. Importantly, Catholic social teaching proposes that this right needs to be broadly interpreted. So it should include the search for economic opportunities and a better life, as well as for people who are escaping specific threats to their safety. So if we go back to that uh, document by Pope Pius that I talked about earlier, he said that the Holy Family is the protector of every migrant or refugee who compelled by fear of persecution or by want is forced to leave his native land. And as Love the Stranger points out, this is also reflected in, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, which says that the more prosperous nations are obliged, to the extent they're able, to welcome the foreigner in search of security and a means of livelihood that he cannot find in his country of origin. And this is a really important point, that our obligations go beyond people fleeing persecution or war. They actually go beyond a lot of the established international law in this area, and they extend to all those who are seeking an opportunity to flourish and who are denied that opportunity to flourish in their own countries, as we discussed in the previous chapter. 
So that includes people coming from countries who've been decimated by climate change or where there's been complete economic collapse and they're unable to provide for themselves and their families. Quite often, our politicians and media throw around this term economic migrant. But if any of us were living in those circumstances where we had no chance to work, maybe no chance of even feeding our children, wouldn't we look to find that elsewhere? And this is really relevant to the political debate and some of the rhetoric we've even heard in the past few weeks. Because it also applies to women who are denied the chance to work or study in their home country because of their gender. To people who are driven to the margins because of their sexuality. If somebody is prevented from flourishing or reaching their potential, Catholic teaching says that these people have an absolute right to migrate. And the picture here is of the former nuncio, the, the Pope's ambassador to the, to the UK, um, who, um, and he was visiting people in Napier barracks who are often divided in the media or in political discourse. But they're fleeing persecution, they're fleeing war, they're fleeing absolutely desperate poverty that leaves them without any chance of a dignified life at home. And it's, it's these people who the bishops are saying, we, we need to recognise their stories, the reasons why people have left, and we have a duty to welcome them and facilitate their right to find a place where they can flourish. <coughs> and it's in this chapter that Love the Stranger also addresses the really critical issue of safe routes for people to come here and to travel to other countries. It explains that in upholding the right to migrate, our countries need to develop policies that are humane and that are effective. So it talks about things like resettlement programmes and humanitarian mm -hmm. corridors. And there's been loads of really good work undertaken internationally by organisations like the Jesuit Refugee Service to promote this. Because today, apart from a few specific schemes, like the ones for people fleeing from Hong Kong or Ukraine, or a tiny number of people directly resettled from refugee camps, there are pretty much no opportunities for people to reach the UK safely. So if you're fleeing religious persecution in Pakistan, or the war in Yemen, or the military dictatorship in Myanmar, you, there's really no route available to you to come here. And that's why we see so many people risking their lives on dangerous journeys across the channel as they exercise their right to find a place of safety and security, that right that the church says we all have. And we need to remember, of course, that there are many reasons why people may be seeking refuge, particularly here or in another specific country. They might have family connections here, and they might speak the language. So again, Love the Stranger stresses this fundamental need to go back to the principle of recognising and understanding people's stories, recognising and understanding each person's circumstances. Because just like any of us, if we had to leave the UK, would have particular destinations where we would feel safe and where we would have an opportunity to make a decent life for ourselves and our families, so too does everyone on the move have particular needs and particular places where they may be able to find those opportunities that we need to take account of. Now at the same time as upholding the right of people to move, Catholic teaching does recognise the right of countries to control their borders. The Catechism of the Church says that political authorities for the sake of the common good for which they are responsible, may make the uh, exercise of the right to immigrate subject to various conditions. Now, there are a few really important points here. Firstly, we're talking about controlling borders, not shutting them. So it's reasonable for countries to have processes in place and to expect people arriving to fulfil certain obligations around applying for the right to remain, um, and following the laws of the country and so on. But that's very different to turning people away. And this leads on to the second point, which um, was summed up by Pope Pius here, 
when he said that the rights of the states to control their borders is a limited right. This is a quote from a uh, letter that he wrote to the US bishops, which was reproduced in that document, Exil Familia Nazarafina, which he says, and it's, it's very relevant given the developments um, on the US border recently, that the sovereignty of the state, although it must be respected, cannot be exaggerated to the point that access to this land is for inadequate or unjustified reasons denied to needy and decent people from other nations, provided, of course, that the public wealth, consider very carefully, does not forbid this. So that, that's quite old-fashioned language because he's writing back in the 1940s, but what he's saying is that while the government has the duty to look after its own citizens and a right to control its, its borders, it also has obligations and the responsibility to support people from coming from elsewhere if it can. You can't simply pull up the drawbridge. And thirdly, this has to be viewed in the global context that we talked about earlier. Uh, the photo I took here is, is one from a, a delegation of faith leaders to Lebanon, where there's a population of around 4 million Lebanese nationals who have been joined by over 1 million refugees from Syria since the war started. Now, proportionally, that's the equivalent of around 15 million people arriving in the UK. And drawing on those international obligations and the recognition of a single human family set out in the previous chapters of Love the Stranger, we have a responsibility to help countries when they may be genuinely struggling to balance caring for their citizens and giving sanctuary to people. So if we take the example of Lebanon, the response can't ever be shutting the country's borders and rejecting people who are fleeing a horrific civil war. But other countries like our own need to step up, both through supporting Lebanon and offering the opportunity for some people to resettle here. And this is really important because we need to remember that the vast majority of refugees live in poorer parts of the world. So if you look at the countries that are hosting the most refugees, apart from Germany, we're talking about Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, Ethiopia, Jordan, Kenya, Uganda, Chad, around 70% of refugees are in fact seeking sanctuary in the country neighbouring their own. And only a tiny minority are ever arriving in places like the UK, which just reinforces why our own countries in richer parts of the world have to play a greater role in supporting those countries that are facing the most pressure. <coughs> now, in the early 2000s, Pope John Paul expanded on what Pope Pius was saying. And as the bishops talk about in Love the Stranger, he stressed that border controls can't simply be reduced to protecting a state's economic prosperity. So when we're thinking about movements like the sudden flow of refugees from Ukraine, we can't simply say, well, it'll cost us to, to host them in the short term and we want to preserve public funds. We've got to think about the bigger picture. And again, in his encyclical Laudato Si a few years ago, Pope Francis gave a description of the common good that covered some of the other factors that we need to take into account when we're considering these sort of situations. So he talked about social peace, about distributive justice, and about care for the poorest of our sisters and brothers. So states do, of course, have a right to make immigration and asylum policy, but these are the sort of things that it needs to be tested against. Another point that Pope Francis has emphasised, and he picks this up very strongly in Fratelli Tutti, is the importance of confronting xenophobia or political exploitations of concerns around migration. The Church recognises that governments have to balance their responsibility to their citizens and their responsibility to welcome migrants and refugees. And it acknowledges 
that in some communities the arrival of people may cause fear or alarm. But it says very clearly that firstly, we have a responsibility to ensure that this fear does not turn into hostility. And secondly, we really need to challenge those who deliberately exploit such fears for their political ends. Uh, related to this, in Love the Strange, the bishops also pick up the point I touched on earlier about how love for your country and welcoming people from elsewhere are not incompatible, they're not mutually exclusive. And the document stresses the fact that our country will actually benefit if we continue developing an openness to others, just like it always has. A few years ago, I had the uh, privilege of taking part in an ecumenical conference um, that was jointly organised by the Vatican and the World Council of Churches to address the issue of racism in response to migration. And I just wanted to share an extract from the final message agreed by the churches taking part, which really speaks into what the bishops are saying in Love the Stranger. It said that we recognise the concerns of many individuals and communities who feel threatened by migrants, whether for security, economic or cultural identity reasons, and these have to be acknowledged and examined. We wish to be in genuine dialogue with all those who hold such concerns. But based upon the principles of our Christian faith, and the example of Jesus Christ, we seek to raise a narrative of love and hope against the populist narrative of hate and fear. And it went on to talk about the practical role that we as Christians can play, saying the churches and all Christians have a mission to proclaim that every human being is worthy of respect and protection. The churches are also called to live out on a daily basis the welcome of the stranger, but also the protection and mutual encouragement to all, each in their diversity of their origins and history, to participate according to their own talents in building a society that seeks peaceful well-being in equality and rejecting all discrimination. And it finished saying churches are constantly called to be places where we experience and learn respect for diversity and where we rejoice in that encounter and that mutual enrichment. So drawing these together, the bishops offer us in Love the Stranger a further five principles, emphasising the right to migrate and that this can be exercised not only by people fleeing threats to their safety, but all those seeking to build a better life for themselves and their families. That while states have a right to control their borders, these cannot be based on economic factors alone. States have a responsibility to promote the common good of the people within their boundaries, and they also have obligations to the wider world. The bishops call for the extension of safe routes so that people can exercise their right to migrate in a safe and dignified manner. And they call for us not to allow the concerns that some communities might have about migration to be exploited for political purposes or to allow these concerns to develop into racist or xenophobic attitudes. And finally, they promote the dialogue with the local church in people's countries of origin and the countries through which they've travelled so that we could better understand their stories. And this is a real benefit that the Catholic Church has given its presence in almost every part of the world. Well, this um, image is taken from a stained glass window of a church in Bristol, and it replaced um, one of the stained glass windows that previously um, honoured Edward Coulston and was removed in recent years, and they had a competition for um, windows to replace it. Um, and as you can see, it depicts the Holy Family making their journey in a contemporary setting, so it could be across the Channel, it could be across the Mediterranean. And I think that's really um, powerful because if, if they were making that their journey today, their flight into Egypt today, whether it was to, to this country, to another country, they, they would be the, the, the people who are, are often discriminated, vilified against, whether that's in, in the press or in politics. 
And it it reminded me of uh, there was a series that the the American iconographer Kelly Lattimore produced, and he depicted the Holy Family as refugees in a whole range of settings. And he said, we can see the journey of any refugee not simply as a political issue or an issue at all. We're talking about people with names, with faces, with stories. And they have something to teach us about what we know, about who God is, about the world we live in, and about who our neighbours are. Um, So I think probably a good place to break for lunch at 12. Um, Enjoy your lunch. I'm looking forward to to talking to, 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 to everyone during lunchtime and um, we'll pick up the next chapters in the afternoon. Quarter to one. Quarter to one. Thank you. Thank you.